There we go. Okay, welcome back for the sequel. Everybody still suitably and properly depressed from the first half? So, I ended the last section on the what the hell do we do question. And that question is where a lot of people are left. And as I mentioned, these types of ideas, they're everywhere. The intellectual terrain is vast. In something like Inception, this is the question of does the top fall or not? That's the ultimate skeptical question of that film. This appears, as I mentioned, in political theory. This appears in aesthetic theory. It appears everywhere. Skeptical problems can infect all manners of thought, all kinds of arguments. To kick off with an example, you might find very weird. But it's a good example. And again, I was procrastinating and I watched it and it fit really well and it's really good. So, I don't know how into stand-up comedy people are here. Has anyone ever heard of Jim Jeffries, the Australian stand-up comedian? Yeah? So, if you haven't, you may have still seen a YouTube video show up on your Facebook feed or something. He's most famous for, especially did a few years ago, where he talked about gun control in the States. Basically saying how, you guys are idiots. And he's right. But at the end of this very famous stand-up bit, he finds himself in a weird skeptical dilemma. So let's see how that works out. Damn, I'm Netflix. I'm good. I pay for stuff. That's a lie. My friend pays for stuff and I use his account. That's the thing. Why should I have my guns taken off me? I've done nothing wrong. That's, look, I agree with you. If you're a responsible gun owner and you don't fuck around with them, then you should be allowed your guns. You really should. But that's not how society works. We have to play to the 1% that are such fuckwits they ruin it for the rest of us. We have to walk as slow as our slowest person to keep society fucking moving, right? I take drugs like a fucking champion, right? We should all be allowed to take fucking drugs, but we can't, can we? Because Sarah took drugs and she stabbed her fucking kids. Oh, oh thanks Sarah, you fucked it up for everyone, right? Everyone should be allowed to drive their car as fast as they can do it, right? But we can't because Jonathan got drunk and ran over a family. Thanks, Jonathan! Now I have to drive a 30, you fucking idiot! See, that's the thing. Why should I have my guns taken off me and responsible? Just because that guy's crazy. Who's to say you're not crazy? That's the thing about crazy people. They don't know they're crazy. That's what makes them crazy. The only thing you know for sure on this earth is I think, therefore I am. You know that you exist. Anything past that is open to interpretation, right? You know you exist and that's it. Right now, I think I'm in Boston talking to 1,200 people. That's what I think I'm doing. But there is a good to fair chance that I'm in a mental home standing in front of a white wall going, I hate guns, I hate guns, I hate guns. It's hard to find this online, but if you have Netflix, this is a good special. <laughs> so, let's get some lights back for you. So, he's making a very logical argument here. He's bringing up a lot of points to show why we need to make some changes to gun control laws. And, I mean, it's a very strong argument. Yes, it's in the context of a stand-up comedy special, but it's a very strong argument. But then, where does he end up? I know you're not crazy. Maybe I'm just standing in a room saying, I hate guns. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe my argument sucks. He just basically threw his brain out of his head and basically said, no, my arguments suck now because maybe I'm nuts and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So he takes Descartes' idea of hitting on those axioms. You know you exist. You know you're conscious. You know you have an identity. Past that, what? This is where postmodernism goes, say, yeah, it's open to interpretation. It's all arbitrary. It's all up in the air. Just fight it out amongst yourselves, and maybe you'll be lucky, and you'll be the winner, and people will do shit your way. Not all philosophers like that. There are different schools of thought that try to figure out a way to deal with this skeptical problem. Now, some philosophical perspectives, something like positivism, 
that's a philosophical position where they try to hit on certain knowledge. They try to show, this is how I know stuff. The standard question, how do you know? Maybe you're wrong. Positivism tries to say, no, here's how I know, and this is why I'm right. That's one strand that you can go. There's another strand that basically is trying to take a pragmatic view of how we live our lives and how we sort of structure society. The two different strands that we're gonna deal with, <coughs> one of them from the American side is known as pragmatism. And pragmatism kind of starts in the late 1800s with an American philosopher named Charles Saunders Peirce. On the other side, there's a philosophy that was originally known as Oxford philosophy, but now it's more commonly referred to as ordinary language philosophy. And that kind of starts in the middle of the 20th century with a British guy named J.L. Austin. An important bridge between those two traditions is the German philosopher I mentioned in the first part, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein kind of carried on the pragmatic ethos, and then he kind of laid the groundwork for what became ordinary language philosophy. <coughs> so we'll start with pragmatism. Pragmatism is exactly what it sounds like. If you're to look at pragmatism in the dictionary, that's what pragmatic philosophy is. Whatever works. If it works, do it. If it doesn't, don't. Very straightforward, no bullshit. Stop going through all this stupid crap they cart, you're an idiot. None of that. Just, if it works, do it. And for Peirce, this is a quote from The Fixity of Belief. That is an essay that is one of your secondary readings, if you feel like talking about pragmatism at some point. In The Fixity of Belief, Peirce says, Logicality in regard to practical matters is the most useful quality an animal can possess, and might therefore result from the action of natural selection. So you can hear, in that type of language, a kind of evolutionary perspective. Peirce kind of follows a thread that nobody else really picked up on in Descartes. I mentioned that Descartes was a religious man, but he was a scientist, first and foremost. And Descartes makes a lot of mention throughout the meditations of following what he calls the natural light, or common sense. He tries to find, maybe there's just an intuitive understanding. He was sort of like a proto-Darwinian. And it's important that he calls it the natural light, not the supernatural light. The natural light, just something in there, something in humans. Peirce, talking in the 1870s, he's starting to get closer to proper evolutionary logic. <clears throat> so I brought up the idea that kind of shows up in Inception. The idea that when an idea gets in there, you don't know whether it's going to come to define you and be a positive influence in your life or whether it's going to destroy you. This type of an evolutionary logic, you can see that in Descartes where he kind of had trust in a self-regulating mechanism. Something like an evolutionary logic where here's my thought experiment and now based on these ideas, I'm going to go over here. Yeah, that's stupid, that's not going to work. And then you kind of go over here. That's the natural light. That's that common sense that he's trying to get at. That's what Peirce and a lot of pragmatists try to emphasize. So when you get to something like this, last week, again, I'm going to beat up on this guy because I like doing it. You saw the name on the slide Jacques Derrida. Jacques Derrida is a French philosopher of the 20th century. He came up with something that became known as deconstruction. That's another paradigm for you. Professor Bowman will steer it in a more positive direction. But for me, I hate deconstruction. And deconstruction is steeped in skepticism. And it was very influential as sort of a philosophical foundation for what became postmodern. In 1982, a man named Jonathan Culler wrote a book on deconstruction. And in that book is this quote. Deconstruction cannot be brought together in a coherent synthesis. For this reason, it may not seem valid to many who would argue that logic forbids contradiction. The objection to this double procedure invokes physical and empirical inappropriateness. Deconstruction's procedure is called sawing off the branch on which one is sitting. This may be, in fact, an apt description of the activity, for though it is unusual and somewhat risky, it is manifestly something one can attempt. One can and may continue to sit on a branch while sawing it. The question then becomes whether one will succeed in sawing it clear through and where and how one might land. Those are three questions, not one question. He's not a very good writer either. 
If sawing off the branch on which one is sitting seems foolhardy to men of common sense, it is not so for Nietzsche, Freud, Heidegger, and Derrida. For they suspect that if they fall, there is no ground to hit. I've been reading academic theory stuff for like 10 years. That might be the dumbest thing I've ever read. That might get the prize. That might be the dumbest thing I've ever read in my life. This type of logic, if a pragmatist read this, they would say, OK, go ahead and saw off the branch. I'll wait. Go ahead. You're almost done. Splat. OK, are we done now? Can we move on? That would be a pragmatist response to this type of skepticism. Incidentally, it was in an effort to avoid precisely this type of skeptical nonsense that Descartes wrote the Meditations. And he tried to implore philosophers to make a distinction between what he calls the conduct of life and the contemplation of the truth. Now Descartes, one of the coolest things about him, he wrote the Meditations, but he didn't just publish it right away. He sent it out, not email, not a little Facebook message, he sent out hard copies of the Meditations and sent it out to everybody. Theologians, philosophers, anyone. He said, find the smartest people you can find and have them write up some responses and objections to what I said. And then when I get that back, I'll reply and try to justify my ideas, and it will publish the whole thing. So you'll see my arguments, smart people's rejections of them or critiques of them, and then my attempts to bring that into line. So the thing that I have listed for the secondary readings, that includes all of this material. And it's cool to watch. 1640s French people argue with each other. And one of the objectors brought up the fact that there seems like this weird distinction. It seems like you're leaving open the door for this type of skepticism. So Descartes replied, when I said in the meditations that the entire testimony of the senses should be regarded as uncertain and even as false, I was quite serious. So as he's going through the dream analogy, he's pointing out that you can't trust the fact that your senses are telling you you smell something or you touch something. You can touch stuff in dreams. In the first dream sequence in Inception, you maybe you'll remember this little small bit when Cobb is trying to keep Maul in one place, saying, just stay here. I'm going to go steal this dude's stuff. And he ties the little rope to her chair and he touches her leg. That stuff can fuck with you. That can trip you up. So Descartes' thought experiment was, let's try to get away from the senses too. But he makes the key point that when it's a question of organizing our life, however, it would of course be foolish not to trust the senses. And the skeptics who neglected human affairs to the point where friends had to stop them falling off precipices deserve to be laughed at. Those are Descartes' words. Like, okay, yeah, we can think about this stuff, and it's good to try to investigate things and push things. But in real life, you will die if you saw off the branch that you're sitting on if you're up in a tree. Come on, he's trying to get these people to not be that stupid. And to me, the rise to philosophical prominence of stuff like this is the most tragic validation of a fear expressed by a man named Antoine Arnold, who was one of the people who responded to Descartes' meditations. He was worried of the harm those of only moderate intelligence could do to themselves and others if they tried to adopt Descartes' freestyle of philosophizing, which calls everything into doubt. Now, I mentioned in the previous section of this lecture that postmodernism, it's kind of crazy, but most people, they don't follow it all the way through. They pull the reins a little bit. By the same token, most people aren't as skeptical as their words make them seem like. Most people don't push skepticism all the way through. This guy didn't climb up in a tree and saw the branch off that he was sitting. He wrote this book, and he still never went up in a tree and saw it off the branch. He kept writing stuff and came up with new additions to this thing. So the, pragma the pragmatic response, we went through that. Ordinary language philosophy now will take a slightly different tack. Ordinary language philosophy will try to explore someone's thoughts like this and try to analyze the particular forms of expression and see if the way you express an idea leads to what's known as a performative contradiction. If it turns out that you're saying something but doing something else, then the wires are crossed somewhere. Now, typically, another false dichotomy is that between theory and practice. This is what justifies the, that's not real Marxism, not real communism, the no true Scotsman fallacy. That's the idea that, okay, in theory, Marxism is obviously awesome, it's obviously the best thing. In practice, yeah, everybody died, but that's just because Stalin and Mao suck. 
If I were the dictator in charge, I would do this stuff better. That shows you got some psychological problems if you think dictatorship is a valid form of government, but the idea that there's a distinction between theory and practice, ordinary language philosophy rejects that and shows, look, that's not the way you're actually doing stuff. That's not the way you're actually living. So where are the wires getting crossed here? Let's take another fun example to see how this shows up in the world. We went through stand-up comedy the first time. We'll go to this. All right, we'll just tell Chris he's dreaming because I don't want him to know about my time machine. Why not? Yeah, it's like having a pickup truck. Once people know you've got one, there go your weekends. Chris, can you hear me? Huh? You're dreaming. Dreaming? Yay, no consequences! <laughs> so light life! All right, let's go back six minutes and try this again. Chris, you're dreaming with consequences. What? That's right. So. <laughs> Remember that name Adorno from last week, the high culture snob? He is rolling over in his grave right now, doing philosophy with a family guy and stand-up comedy. So, for some ordinary language philosophy, a little ordinary language philosophy breakdown of that, this is the stuff that Ludwig Wittgenstein specialized in. This is what he made his living doing. And in his 1951 text, On Certainty, which is another one of the secondary readings for you, in that text, this is what he does. He just goes through these types of forms of expression to see if these actually have an effect in the way you live your life. So is there actually a distinction between saying to someone, I am awake, or I'm dreaming with consequences? What's the difference? Is there a difference? If there isn't a difference that has a carryover to the way you conduct your life, is there a point? Or is that just a distinction without a difference? As a skeptic, you can say, yeah, I'm dreaming. but." I'm not going to start shooting people because I might not be dreaming and I don't want to spend my dream in jail. That seems to be sort of silly logic, and that's the type of stuff that Wittgenstein tries to investigate. So in uncertainty, this is an example that he uses. <clears throat> if I make an experiment, I do not doubt the existence of the apparatus before my eyes. If you're trying to see something through a microscope, you're not going, the microscope might not be here. I have plenty of doubts, but not that. If I do a calculation, I believe without any doubt <coughs> that the figures on the paper aren't switching of their own accord. If you're trying to do seven plus two, as you're writing, it's not gonna turn into 17 times 56. And I also trust my memory the whole time. I trust it without any reservation. The certainty here is the same as that of my never having been on the moon. But imagine people who are never quite certain of anything, but said that various things, like never having been on the moon, were very probably so, and that it did not pay to doubt them. Such a person, then, would say in my situation, it is extremely unlikely that I have ever been in a room. <coughs> How would the life of these people differ from ours? For there are people who say that it is merely extremely probable that water over a fire will boil and not freeze, and that therefore, strictly speaking, what we consider impossible is only improbable. What difference does this make in their lives? Imagine someone who's supposed to fetch a friend from the railway station and doesn't simply look the train up in the timetable and go to the station at the right time and says, I have no belief that the train will really arrive, but I'll go to the station all the same. He does everything that the normal person does, but accompanies it with doubt or with self-annoyance. Could you imagine living like that? What a shitty way to spend your time. That would, could drive a person crazy. Are you thinking of Mal in Inception right now? Because I hope so. So there's a contemporary American philosopher named Stanley Cavell. <coughs> Stanley Cavell wrote a book in 1979 called The Claim of Reason. That's another one of your secondary readings. Cavell was taught ordinary language philosophy by J.L. Austin at Harvard in the 50s. And Stanley Cavell, in The Claim of Reason, makes the case that if you follow skepticism through, if you let these type of ideas poison your mind, if you start to conduct your life with very skeptical and nonsensical and irrational habits of mind, the end point of the condition that he calls living one skepticism, the end point is insanity. You'll drive yourself nuts. If you try to live like that, you will end up in a room saying, I hate guns, I hate guns. You will end up in a rubber room. You'll lose your mind. But again, remember the point I brought up in the beginning. What Descartes realized was 
Maybe skepticism isn't something out there that you defeat. Maybe skepticism is something inside. Maybe it's that little voice in your head that doubts that you have to be constantly vigilant against. <clears throat> so, I brought up Mal from Inception. Inception, to me, is the ultimate skepticism movie. It lays things out so clearly. All the ideas that I've brought up here, they're in Inception. Christopher Nolan is working his way through centuries of philosophical thought. And to sort of start bringing this together and start working our way into Inception, so that we'll be able to continue to argue about the movie and whether the top falls in the seminar, we can move to watch a clip from it. Now, I'm sure you've all seen Inception a thousand times. I'd be surprised if anyone saw it more than me. I saw it in theaters six times on its first release, and that doesn't even count the millions of times I've watched it since. I think Inception is the best movie of the 21st century, and I stand by my claim from the first week of the lecture that it's the coolest movie that we're dealing with this term. It's just awesome. So the clip that we're going to watch is, to me, the key philosophical sequence. I'd love to just show you all two and a half hours of the movie, but we don't have that kind of time. So this scene we're going to watch is after Cobb and Ariadne have gone into limbo, and they've gone after Fisher. And Cobb confesses that Mal committed suicide as a result of his performing conception of her. I do it by this given out. Is that English? Yeah. 
asking the question, the reality came from me. I planted the idea in my mind. What is she talking about? The reason I knew Inception was possible was because I, I did it to her first. I did it to my own wife. Why? We were lost in here. I knew we needed to escape, but she wouldn't accept it. She had locked something away, something, something deep inside. A truth that she had once known, but chose to forget when she couldn't break free. So I decided to search for it. I went deep into the recess of her mind and found that secret place. I broke in and I planted an idea. A simple little idea that would change everything. Her world wasn't real. trying to sort of connect into the movies. For what's left, I'll kind of give you like a little bit of a reading. Show like for when you do your presentations or write your essays, sort of how to break down a movie from a different, from a particular perspective. So when I first watched this movie, I never read Descartes. I didn't know who Charles Saunders Peirce was. I never heard of Wittgenstein. If I read that name, I'd probably say Wittgenstein or Wittgenstein. You don't have to be able to consciously articulate these types of complex, highfalutin philosophical ideas to be able to know that that fucking top falls, it just does. But when you have these types of ideas and you have these types of philosophical perspectives, you can bring them to bear on films like this and you can see these types of people, I don't know Christopher Nolan's life story, I don't know if he ever took a philosophy class, but you can see even just in everyday life, these types of philosophical ideas manifest themselves. These types of philosophical perspectives determine how people live their lives, determine how people make their movies. So. In that sequence, you have a manifestation of skepticism. That's Mal. The projection from Cobb's mind, that is skepticism. That is the little voice in your head. No creeping doubts? Huh? Come on, maybe you're wrong. That's skepticism inside of his head. And to me, the brilliance of Christopher Nolan's, the brilliance of the script and the way that this film is edited and executed, it's structured in a way that Everything she's saying is kind of valid. Being persecuted by random dudes with guns that show up everywhere, just like the way projections chase people in dreams. And that's not real. Come on, dude, you're dreaming. So just hang out here with me. All these types of ideas are showing up just in this one little sequence. And Stanley Cavell, in addition to doing proper philosophy, he's written a lot of, about movies. And his definition of film is a moving image of skepticism. To his mind, 
The very condition of watching a film brings us into contact with the type of skeptical experiences that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. So if film itself leads us into these types of skeptical alleyways, then something like Inception, holy shit, that's blowing our minds here. And from a philosophical perspective, Cavell makes an interesting little move. For Cavell, he's seeing all this stuff that people are talking about when it comes to knowledge. What you know, how you know it, how can you get certainty, maybe you're wrong, all this stuff. Cavell makes a little bit of a sideways step. And his hypothesis is that maybe it's not about knowledge per se. Maybe it's about acknowledgement. Little play on words, he's an ordinary language philosopher. So maybe it's not about coming upon things that you were once ignorant of, not coming to new knowledge. Maybe it's just acknowledging what you already know, what you can't not know. You can't not know that you exist. You can't not know that you have a brain. You can't not know these things. But what happens is you become like Mao. You lock something away that you once knew. You let your mind wander, and you keep that shit in the safe. Mull in this film refuses to acknowledge reality. That's her dilemma. That's her problem. And you can think back to the Alan Watts video that we watched at the beginning. He goes through this entire process. He goes through the entire limbo experience that Cobb and Mull went through together. They were there. They were gods. They were building giant things. Eventually, Cobb got bored. It's like, this sucks. It's not real. I want to go back up. It's been 50 years here. Let's go. We're old now. Let's go back to reality. It's like if you're playing a game with your friends and they let you win. That's not that fun. It's better when they try as hard as they can and they're huffing and puffing and you say, yeah, I'm better than you. That's better. That's more fun. That's reality. That's what Cobb wanted. That's what Mal didn't want. She didn't want that. She said, no, I'm happy here. Leave me alone. In my world of film studies, the most prominent Christopher Nolan scholar is a man named Todd McGowan. Todd McGowan wrote a book on Christopher Nolan and the inception chapter was titled A Plea for the Abandonment of Reality. And he says that Maul is the hero of the film. Talk about missing the fucking point. That's like saying Tyler Durden is the hero of Fight Club and that the critique of consumer culture is the best part and is the point. Did you watch the same movie as me? That's kind of, and this also, by the way, keep this stuff in mind in the future when you get to stuff like Blade Runner and you're dealing with things like post-structuralism, these types of questions. Which film do we watch? Is there only one film? These are things that we can argue about in the seminar if you think the top falls or if you think Tyler Durden is the hero of Fight Club. But for me, Mal is the villain. And Cobb's heroic triumph, the reason that the music swells at the end, the, reeling, the reason that you feel that uplift is because Cobb acknowledges reality. The title of anything written on Inception should be the, a plea for the acknowledgement of reality, not the plea for the abandonment. <laughs> and the way to do that is to cultivate a strength of mind, a strength of will, a strength of character, to <coughs> calibrate those two things that are sometimes at war with each other, what Descartes calls the intellect and the will. One of Descartes' French contemporaries named Blaise Pascal, a little bit after the meditation was published, he wrote something called The Art of Persuasion, and he talked about how in every human being there is a war between the intellect and the will, and it's bloody and it's constant. But if you want to reach the point that Cobb reaches at the end of Inception, you've got to be able to align those things. You can't let your mind wander. You've got to be able to pull on those reins. <coughs> and it takes strength to do that. But notice, like I was talking about, the structure of Inception. Notice the mirroring and the repetition here. Cobb in this sequence is brought to, make, is brought to the point where he has to make the exact same choice that he made before. He was in limbo. He didn't want to be there, so he got the hell out. In doing that, his wife died. That hurts. That is painful as fuck. You have to be strong as hell to be able to hold on to your mind after something like that. Here he's faced with the same opportunity. You see in the sequences when he's riding up the elevator of his memories, there his regrets, the things he has to change. He didn't change that memory. He made the exact same choice. But she's saying, he was talking about what you believe. He says, no, I know. He's certain here. He knows. And he makes the same choice. And that takes the kind of strength that Charles Saunders Peirce talked about. Peirce says this in the same essay. It's part of your secondary reading. 
A clear, logical conscience does cost something, just as any virtue, just as all that we cherish costs us dear. But we should not desire it to be otherwise. The genius of a man's logical method should be loved and reverenced as his bride. She is the one that he has chosen, and he knows that he was right in making that choice. And having made it, he will work and fight for her, and will not complain that there are blows to take, hoping that there may be as many and as hard to give, and will strive to be the worthy knight and champion of her from the blaze of whose splendors he draws his inspiration and his courage. Cobb is staring into the eyes of the woman he loves, the love of his life, the woman he had to watch jump from a fucking window and watch die. But that's just a projection. That's just his guilt. That's not his bride. He's not going to complain that there are blows to take. He's going to hold on to his mind. He's going to hold on to that certainty. He's going to get back up above. He's going to be back with his kids, and everything will be OK again. That's this type of logic. That's the type of logic that you're seeing work out in Inception. That's the type of lesson that Christopher Nolan is working his way through. And that type of logic, this stuff, you see this everywhere, too. We've already watched stand-up comedy. We've already watched Family Guy. Now we can watch something where you see another rendition of this trajectory that you see in Inception. Again, a little out of the box, a little weird. But there is a YouTube channel called Super Train. And it's run by a man named Mark Bell. Mark Bell is a power lifter and a motivational speaker and a giant in the fitness industry. And he made the following video. think about great people, you think about people that they write stories about, you think about people that they make movies about, you hear all these, uh, all this talk about these great presidents and these great warriors of the past and these great people. What makes those people different? Why are those people special? Those people are known and their legacy lives on even after they're dead for one reason. It's because they are fucking original. They are different. There's no carbon copy of them. They only make one when they make these types of people. Each one of you have a unique story. Each one of you have a different story to tell. And my story is that I struggled like hell in school. I was fucking dumb. If school it was an indicator of how smart you are when you were a kid, then I was dumb. If making money is an indicator of kicking ass as an adult, then I am currently kicking a lot of fucking ass. And the only way that I was able to do that was through building confidence in the gym. It may not be that powerlifting saved your life like it has with mine, it may not be that powerlifting changed your life forever, but the dedication to the weights should mean something more, than, more to you than just lifting weights. You're not trying to just make yourself strong on the outside, make yourself big on the outside. We're trying to create a better person. Each and every day, we are, we are faced with a lot of resistance. We're faced with a lot of negativity. What do we have in our lives that's positive? One thing that we can control is working on ourselves. <laughs> I'm a motivator, but I'm not a magician. I can't fix your problems. I can't fix your problems. You have to fix your own problems. But you can't ever be satisfied with what you're currently doing. Satisfied athletes suck. Write that down. You have to embrace strength as a lifestyle. If you want to be good, it's only going to take a little bit of work, a little bit of coaching. Anyone can be good. But if you want to be great, if you want to be special, if you want to try to get to that next level, it's going to take that much more effort. You're going to have to really go way out of your way towards making yourself great.
So, again, philosophy is everywhere. Shows up in Inception, stand-up comedy, family guy, dudes lifting weights. And you don't have to give a shit about lifting weights. You can think lifting weights is the dumbest way to spend your time. That's fine. The point of this is not just physical strength, as he says, the strength of mind and of character. That's what people like Charles Saunders Peirce try to get at. And that's what we see Cobb realize towards the end. Notice that point in the video we just watched where he says he's a motivator but not a magician. He can't fix your problems. He can't fix your problems. That is that Cartesian realization again. This idea, it might destroy you, but I'm not responsible for your mind. I'm not responsible for your responsibility of thinking for yourself. Cobb is not responsible for the fact that his wife jumped out of the window. That was the idea that he put in her head. But she could have thought that. She could have developed that type of strength. That's this type of logic. And the fact that Cobb makes that choice again, that brings this whole thing home, this type of strength. <clears throat> so he could have stayed in limbo, but he decided, no, I want to come back to reality. And once he gets home, he spins the top, and he walks away. For a lot of people, that will say that, see, it doesn't matter whether he's in reality or a dream. Yeah, it does. It's the whole point of the movie. But you might disagree with that. And that's the nature of this film. Professor Bowman was talking about last week about how Inception can be seen as a postmodernist text. It doesn't have one interpretation. It's open to many. That's true. It's open to many. Whether you actually characterize it as a postmodern text is determined by whether you believe there are many valid interpretations or whether you believe there are many interpretations, but one correct one. I don't know what you believe. I'm not responsible for your thinking. But I think the top falls. If you don't, we can argue about that in the seminars. So that's pretty much all I've got. I'll just say at the end here that this was the first time I've ever gotten a lecture. So thank you for coming here and participating and watching this crap. It's talking about Inception, so these guys helped make a dream come true for me, so thank you.